Hello and welcome to the AVS eTalk on mass production of 2D electronic medical diagnostics for home use. Our presenter today is Christopher Miratori with the Ohio Research Scholars Endowed Chair Professor at University of Dayton. Just want to go through some informational slides as people are logging in and then we'll welcome Chris to present for the morning. When you logged in, you are automatically muted. Be sure your volume is up and that your screen view is in full view. This is a one hour presentation with no scheduled breaks. Uh, upon registering, if you submitted a question, if it's not if the answer is not already incorporated into the eTalk, hopefully Chris will be able to answer that at the end of the session. If you have additional questions, you can use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen to type in any questions for Chris. Uh, he will review and answer the questions in about the last 10 to 15 minutes of today's e-talk. Do you want to make a note that we have a couple of disclaimers and copyright notice? Uh, please read these briefly, um, and we'll go through. This presentation is based on sources to believe, believe to be reliable, but the AVS and author instructor disclaim any warranty or liability based on or relating to the contents of this e-talk. AVS and its author instructor do not endorse any products, processes, manufacturers, or suppliers. Nothing in this talk should be interpreted as implying such an endorsement. And then our copyright notice, the material contained in this e-talk was copied with the permission of the author instructor of the notes, who obtained copyright releases from other materials. Since the AVS does not own the copyright of the material in this e-talk, permission to use any part of this material must be obtained from the author instructor. Uh, we do have a couple of upcoming in-person training programs. If you're not aware of them, we do have some. We have one in uh, our AVS National Short Course Program. We're going to be offering the Fundamentals of Vacuum Technology. It's a four-day course. This will be offered in Oregon November 6th through 9th, 2023, during our AVS International Symposium. Registration will be coming soon. Our AVS Rocky Mountain chapter is also hosting an in-person short course program in Westminster, Colorado, September 13th through 15th. They are developing their schedule and registration will also be available soon. We have an upcoming webinar in just a couple of weeks. It's an AVS professional development webinar called Cultivating Your Leadership Skills, a review of effective leadership traits and practices. This is a free one hour webinar on June 22nd. Registration is open. And we have several technical meetings coming up, ALD, ALE in Bellevue, Washington this summer in July. We also have MIOMD in Norman, Oklahoma in August. Uh, the Gallium Oxide Workshop also in August in Buffalo, New York. And NAMBI in September in Madison, Wisconsin. And the AVS 69th International Symposium and Exhibition in Oregon this coming November. Uh, please check out these meetings. If any of these topics are of interest to you, you can go to the AVS website and find our events calendar. And if you're not already an AVS Platinum member, we do encourage you to join and expand your network, enhance your scientific and professional knowledge, uh, have an opportunity to develop and practice your leadership skills, and receive discounts on various subscriptions, meeting attendance, and more. Following this e-talk, please visit the avs.org website to find out more about membership, including discounts on various events. And if you're a student, this is a great time to find out about student membership and chapters, career services, and more. And finally, we do have an online evaluation form we ask that you complete following today's e-talk. And at this time, I'd like to welcome Chris Miratori, who will present on the mass production of 2D electronic medical diagnostics for home use. Chris, thank you for coming in with us, and I'll let you take over from here. Thanks so much, Heather. I really appreciate the introduction and the opportunity to speak. While you were showing the uh, those informational slides, uh, I had a, a great memory. So when I was a brand new graduate student, Within the first two weeks, there was an AVS short course. I was a student at the Colorado School of Mines, and uh, I think it was at that very same hotel. I took a reactive sputtering course with Bill Westwood, and uh, it shaped my thoughts and thinking. Uh, even even to this day, I still think about and use some of the the principles I learned in that that great short course. So that was a nice blast from the past. Thank you for that. I'm grateful for everyone who uh, came to be with me. It's uh, I'm on the East Coast. It's a summer afternoon, and uh, I'm glad you're choosing to spend uh, some of that time this nice afternoon with me today. 
And uh, actually, I saw this email last week. I, I just looked at the subject line and said, ooh, that sounds like a cool talk. <laughs> and then I realized that it was it was mine. And uh, I'm excited to share some of these ideas uh, that we've encountered over the last, uh, it's been three years that we've been working on this, this project now. And this uh, is kind of a pictorial summary. I'll, I'll focus a little bit on how we came to be able to make lots of 2D electronic devices, a super high device yields greater than 99% than using some techniques that are a little bit different than the techniques that are usually used to make uh, 2D materials and to fabricate devices uh, in, with integrated 2D materials. And then we'll talk about some of the the applications for these mass-produced electronic 2D devices in the form of these um, at-home, inexpensive uh, wireless virus detection systems. And then we'll talk about some of the, the typical data that we can get uh, from these systems. Using 2D materials, the, the real benefit is that they're, they're really sensitive. And so you can kind of access a space that we can't get to from the, the tests that we buy at the, the CBS. Uh, I'm very fortunate at the, at the University of Dayton, I have been able to work with many, many good students, but, uh, and that's typical for lots of universities, but we're also very close to the Air Force Research Laboratory. I worked there for about 10 years before I moved to the University of Dayton in 2012. And uh, we're able to, to work with some really remarkable scientists um, who have expertise, expertise with some really remarkable equipment. Um, if you've ever had a chance to to visit AFRL, you probably know what I'm talking about. There's just lab after lab filled with very state of the art equipment and, and lots of innovative ideas and and uh, about ways to use that equipment. So we're grateful to have a good collaboration with them. The students are able to work in the labs alongside these scientists, and they have a really excellent experience um, uh, in terms of professional development and just being able to use uh, equipment that they may may not be able to access if we were at uh, a university without access to the the Air Force Research Lab. So I'm guessing most of you have had experience taking a, an at-home virus test, and this is just one type of test that you can buy at the, the store. They all work on a principle that's pretty similar and hasn't changed much over the last 40 years. There's essentially something like a, a paper towel or an absorbent pad, and you put a liquid sample on there. It could be a, a nasal swab and sometimes that nasal swab is, is digested in a fluid that, that breaks any virus particles open and, and gives the test access to some of the proteins that are in the, in the virus. Um, oftentimes, the, virus, the proteins inside the virus are um, more abundant than the proteins kind of bound to the outside of the virus. So there can be some advantages in busting those viruses apart. You can kind of get higher sensitivity this way. It's a, a common cheat to get um, better sensitivity in these uh, lateral flow assay devices. So you put your sample on the pad and it migrates through a series of different regions on the pad. The first region are these bead decorated antibodies. These antibodies will bind to the virus protein in the sample if there is some in the sample. And so the virus binds to this antibody decorated with this bead and the couple travel together to this region that's lined with complementary antibodies. And if the virus is attached to this antibody decorated with the particle, then they make a sandwich and they you get alignment of these particles so you can see them, right? So if you get a plus sign or whatever, the indicator shows that you're positive, that means that you've made this sandwich, right? The virus is in the middle and it's surrounded by these antibodies bound to the surface of the sensor and also bound to these beads that you can see. So this is the this is the way we do it, and it's pretty good. It's easy to use. You know, I got a little bit tired of spending twenty bucks every time I wanted to take one of these tests. There's some some immunocompromised people in my life, so I have to take a lot of of tests to make sure that I don't give them something that their body can't cope with. I, I think that's not um, terrible. It's not as bad as the, the low sensitivity. So for COVID, more than the flu, early detection was really important, right? Because you were most contagious or are most contagious with COVID before you start to feel the symptoms. And so testing was really critical to stop the spread of, of COVID more so than like the flu. When you have the flu, you're most contagious, usually when you feel the worst. And um, I think we've all become a little more responsible at showing up to work sick or, or being around people when we're sick. 
But if you don't know you've got something and can still spread it, testing becomes really critical. Another um, uh, less than ideal aspect of these lateral flow at home assays is that they're slow. It takes a lot of time. So it's not really practical to you know, take one at the entrance to a stadium or a theater or something like that. So there's a lot of room for improvement in this decades old technology. And I think that maybe the, the future of diagnostic testing lies in a device with the architecture, kind of like the one that I'm showing here pretty simplistically. This is just an electronic device. And this is not a new idea. The first paper on using uh, electronic sensing devices using principles similar to the ones here was published in 1970. I think the real difference is in the transducer material. So we have access to materials that are much more sensitive than we did in 1970. But the way that this thing works is you've got a semiconducting material bridging two metal contacts, right? These are electrically conductive. The semiconducting material has a variable electrical conductivity. You can change it, right? So a semiconducting material and like a transistor, you apply a potential to that semiconducting material and can change its electrical conductivity. And in that way, turn this transistor on or off. You can either make there be very low electrical conductivity between these two electrodes or higher electrical conductivity between these electrodes and turn the thing on and off. What we're doing here is we're using these molecules to change that electrical conductivity, and we are able to do it in, in a really simple way um, where the most sensitivity to uh, applied potential is when we're just kind of at, at uh, zero uh, potential on the semiconductor material. I'll show you what I'm talking about in just a second. But by making these simple electronic measurements with these materials, we're able to get pretty high sensitivity measurements. The reason this transducer material is really important is uh, what we're using, I've indicated here, is this two-dimensional MOS2. So a two-dimensional material is just a material that's five molecular layers thick or thinner. That's my definition. Maybe other people would, would have a, a different definition. But I think that's in the ballpark of what mo most people would say a 2D or two-dimensional material is. It's just really, really thin, five molecular layers or less. And the reason that thickness is important is because what I'm going to do is I'm going to alter effectively the carrier concentration, the number of charge carriers that can flow from one contact to the other in the semiconducting material. And if I have a thick material, well, I'm just going to, it's just going to be a drop in the bucket. The amount of electrons that I can alter with this tiny electric field from this bound molecule is going to be small. But when I have a really thin material, then I'm affecting a more appreciable fraction of the total number of electrons that are available for conduction. So this is the basic idea. So I've just taken a, I've just taken a little snippet. I've zoomed in on this section of this 2D electronic device right here. Then I want to talk about two different scenarios. So I mentioned before, this is, this is a close-up of my MOS2, right? In this diagram, I've got three molecular layers. And I'm going to pass current from this electrode on the left to the electrode on the right. And that current is going to flow through the semiconducting material. And the electrical conductivity, right, sigma in this equation down at the top of this list in the lower left-hand corner of your screen, is dependent on the charge on the charge carrier, which is just a constant. It's dependent on the mobility of the charge carrier. Let's just say that's a constant associated with the semiconducting material. If I'm going to change the electrical conductivity, which is kind of like the primary feature of the semiconducting material in this device, then I'm going to change N, which is the number of charge carriers, the number of entities moving across this from one gap to the other through the semiconducting material. In the material, the 2D material that we use, it's P-type. And what that means is that there are positively charged charge carriers that are responsible for moving current through this device. And if I put a charged particle on the surface, you can imagine what's going to happen, right? Let's say I have a negatively charged particle like the spike protein. This is like if you've seen a picture of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, right? It looks like a sea urchin or like a sea mine, right? It's got all these spikes on it. Well, those spikes are this special protein that's on the outside that is easy to break off and use for detection. Anyway, that thing is generally negatively charged uh, under kind of body pH conditions. Then, so if I attach or bind a negatively charged uh, molecule to this MOS2 surface, this 2D MOS2 surface, 
then I'm going to attract these charge carriers. They're going to be available for conduction. They're going to increase, effectively increase this value of N, this is charge carrier density. And if I put a positively charged molecule on the surface, right, if this molecule comes along and binds to the MOS2 surface, is positively charged going to push away those positive charge carriers? It's going to inhibit their motion from one channel or from one, uh, one electrode to the other through this conductive channel. So this is the idea. I'm using this 2D material to detect charge. So if I have a binding event on the surface, then I'm going to get a change in the electrical or electronic properties of that semiconducting material. So that's the principle. It's a totally different principle than this lateral flow assay thing that I showed you, right? This is, uh, you're looking at a, a color change from these particles that have migrated along this uh, the surface. While the, the modality or while the detection mechanism is totally different, what's nice about an electronic test is you can use it in exactly the same manner as you would use a lateral flow assay test. And so here are some instructions for our uh, electronic uh, sensing or electronic virus sensing device. And again, all the steps are exactly the same. There's some simplification in that the, the data is beamed wirelessly to, uh, to your cell phone. Uh, and then, then there's a lot of things that can happen once your phone has access to that data, right? It can give you some guidance on how to seek treatment. It can give you some emergency contact numbers of people to call to seek aid. It can give you instructions about how to keep uh, from getting others to get sick. It can inform uh, people uh, of the fact that you're sick. So there's a lot of, of potential advantages. One of the, the features of this technology is that we were careful to select materials that were entirely recyclable. If this uh, if this product is as promising as it looks to be, then we expect there to be many many users, and we don't want to uh, to be a bad guy. We don't want to be the next single use plastic water bottle that's found in like whale bellies, and and we become bad guys. But we want to have something that's easy to recycle and and uh, reclaim. So all the materials that we use are naturally abundant and, and easy to recycle. So if we think about this, this mechanism, how these sensor devices work, then what we need is something that has a big response to the amount of current that flows from one electrode to the other with the application of a very small number of these molecules, right? If we're gonna have a very sensitive detection system, then the charge from this bound molecule needs to strongly affect the current that flows through the sensor. That's what we're measuring, right? We're measuring the amount of current that flows from one electrode to the other. So the bigger the impact of applying a charge to the surface is, the more sensitive my system will be. So with that in mind, we, we want to use these 2D materials for this because we know they're sensitive, but not all 2D materials are created equally. Some are going to be more sensitive than others. And it's kind of easy to look in the literature and decide which material is going to be the most sensitive and, and how to use that material in this sensor device. So there are many, many papers on this topic for both MOS2 and graphene, but there are many more papers on graphene than there are for MOS2. And graphene is a, an interesting choice for this device because graphene is not um, graphene is not a great semiconducting material. It's a great electronic conductor. But uh, one of the downsides of graphene is that the, the band gap is very small. The, um, and that affects the, the difference in the current that will flow when the device is turned on, like the maximum current I can flow through the device, and the current that will flow when the device is turned off, the minimum current that I can flow through the device. So you can see here, it goes from like three units to 12 units. Uh, it's kind of like the max change. So imagine this, this is this is a, a graph made from a conventional transistor where the transistor is structured a lot like this sensor device, except instead of a biomolecule, you have some kind of electrode, right? It's on an insulator and you put a voltage on this electrode. That is how you're controlling the value on the x-axis with turning a knob on a power supply and changing the voltage applied to that semiconducting material. What we're trying to do is not use a power supply, but we're trying to use these bound 
charged molecules on the surface to alter this value on the x-axis. And so every molecule that binds is going to shift in one direction or the other, whether it's positive or negative, along this x-axis. And what I'm going to measure is the change in current. Right, with each bound molecule, I'm gonna change the ability for current to flow through this device. And so what this means is the steeper this curve is, the more current change I get per unit voltage, that's gonna give me the sensitivity that I want. So this curve has some slope and uh, it's, it's the slope is what it is here. Look at MOS2. So here, my scale on graphene is like from two to 12. On MOS2, the scale goes from 10 to the minus 12 to 10 to the minus seven. It's five orders of magnitude, right? This thing's on a, a log scale, so it looks a little bit different. I have a huge slope that gets me between the off state and the on state. And what that means is for a teeny tiny change in voltage, I get a huge change in current that flows through this device. This is exactly what I want for a very sensitive electronic sensing device is for a small change in charge. Remember, I'm trying to detect very few molecules binding on the surface. That small change in charge, I get a very large measurable response. And what's really handy about MOS2, at least the, the doped MOS2 that we're using, is that I don't have to apply an external voltage. This steep slope occurs when I'm not applying any voltage to the material at all. This means that I don't have to integrate this thing into a transistor device or use it like a transistor device or an active transistor device. I'm, I'm using it as a transistor device where there's no applied voltage. So that enables me to eliminate some steps in fabrication. And it's, it's pretty handy. Um, if you didn't understand what I just said, you can look at this graph all the way on the right. And so if we measure the sensitivity of a graphene device versus an MOS2 device, we see that there's a big difference with the MOS2 device being substantially more sensitive. And it's nice. MOS2 is a naturally abundant material. It's inexpensive. I visited a, a molybdenum mine in Colorado, and they gave me a bucket of MOS2 for free. It's probably about uh, two kilograms of MOS2. It's a, a very inexpensive, and it's a material that uh, is, not, is not dangerous, and it's easy to work with. So I just wanted to summarize the difference between the, the lateral flow assay and these 2D electric, electronic assays, especially when we use a sensitive material like MOS2 that gives us a big response. And the primary benefits of the 2D electronic assay over a typical lateral flow assay is the time. Um, we're not relying on this diffusion process where the, the molecules, like those antibodies, have to diffuse over a long distance, right? Like a macroscopic distance. Instead, we're talking about things that are on the micro scale. Um, it's easy to integrate lots of, we can use kind of modern device making methods to integrate devices for detection of many different targets. So if I buy a COVID test, that's all I know is whether I have COVID or not. But And, and now we see that there are dual tests, right? They'll tell you if you have the flu or if you have COVID. And, and it's just one type of flu generally. Um, and when we know that there's multiple um, types of flu that one can get. So it'd be nice to be able to test for multiple analytes. In the fall and winter, there was a, um, a lot of RSV was a, a big deal making the headlines. So it'd be great to be able to detect all these different uh, viruses that have similar symptoms. It's hard to know which one you have until you take some kind of definitive test. Other aspect we've already talked about is the sensitivity. So for a, a visual test, a test you buy at the store, the maximum limit of detection, the, the smallest amount of virus you can detect is about one nanogram per milliliter. For like a PCR test, you can detect something like this is 10 femtograms per milliliter. That's really where we want to be for early detection of these viruses, which not only help for transmission, but also for treatment, right? The earlier, earlier you detect the flu, the more likely you are to be able to treat the symptoms with uh, some sort of therapy. Um, so yeah, so these are some of the, the primary advantages, the time, the sensitivity, the ability to multiplex. Uh, these are all pretty interesting objectives. Um, there's some other, other features that maybe we'll talk about. One important feature is um, the cost is a lot lower for these 2D electronic uh, assays because you need a lot less antibody to decorate the surface, and, and that turns out to, to provide a substantial savings.
So I mentioned before the idea of using an electronic sensor for detection of viruses is not a new idea. So the first paper was in 1970, and then in the late uh, 1990s, there was a wave of nanomaterial development and integration into devices and demonstration of these devices and cool applications. And this is just a, a fantastic paper by Charles Lieber, uh, who was at Harvard. And, uh, and, and the team that participated in this is kind of a legacy, right? There's still people uh, from this original team of uh, Charles Lieber and, and beyond. There's still a lot of work going on in this area particularly in the field of these, these nanowire or nanotube-based sensors. And this paper was published in 2004. It's, it's an incredible paper. This is a, a picture of the device. There's this silicon nanowire that you can see nicely in this micrograph. In these lower resolution images in the upper left, you can see this nanowire thing right here. And there's a red dot. And the red dot, it kind of dances uh, towards and away from that nanowire. That is a fluorescent virus protein. Uh, it's a virus protein that's been tagged with a fluorescing molecule. And what's cool about this uh, set of images is that you can see in image two and in image five, that virus protein is bound to that silicon nanowire. This silicon nanowire has antibodies attached to it. And so there's selective binding of this, uh, this protein onto those antibodies. And the numbers on this graph correspond to the numbers of these images. So these are electrical connectivity measurements made of this nanowire over time, the same time that's captured in those images. And you can see that when the virus particle is close or bound to that nanowire, that there's this dip, this measurable dip in resistance. So this is a nice demonstration of the power of these low dimensional materials, materials with a high surface to volume ratio and their ability to respond to, a, this is a single molecular binding event that's easily detectable, well, well outside the noise of the measurement of the system. So if this technology 20 plus years old has been around, why are the devices that we buy or the tools that we use for virus detection not based on this nanotechnology? And the answer is that uh, it's really hard to integrate a nanowire into an electronic device. There's, there's techniques to do it, but not at scale, not at economical scale, not at a price where you could sell these tests at a, a price that, that we're willing to pay. Uh, that's my assessment of the state of the art, and maybe somebody knows better than I do. But uh, I think there's a reason that we don't see nanowire-based medical devices, and it's because they're hard to fabricate and hard to make, um, again, at scale, repeatably. So we need something new. And 2D materials were, were really a great step forward in terms of using the, these low-dimensional materials, again, materials with low surface or high surface-to-volume ratios and exquisite sensitivity to ambient uh, interactions. It's still not great. It's still a little bit hard to scale up 2D materials, which are, again, just flat and planar. Um, even though we're very good at integrating flat, planar materials into electronic devices, many decades of experience doing this uh, in the materials uh, community, it's still kind of challenging to make 2D materials at large scale and in large quantities. So this is a paper published by friends and Tarshi Das at uh, Penn State. And they, uh, this was just like a, a superhuman effort required to use traditional 2D materials synthesis processes and integration into devices through some, some kind of traditional 2D fabrication, 2D device fabrication processes. So you grow the material on a substrate, and generally that involves really high temperatures, six or 700 degrees C and some, some kind of dangerous and toxic uh, metallorganic precursor materials. There's different ways to do it. But in general, uh, you can also sputter metals and then use hydrogen sulfide. It's a very toxic, very dangerous gas. But you can grow these materials on a substrate and then transfer them onto a device substrate. So oftentimes you, you can't, the temperatures and the processes are not really compatible with the substrates that you ultimately want to use for a device. And sometimes there's some strains at the interface that you need to release through this transfer process to make a, a functional device. And then you can do some traditional kind of nanolithography, other, other techniques to make these devices, and you end up with a, a 
2D semiconducting materials sandwiched by these electrical contacts. This is good in this paper. This is a, a fantastic paper, but the, there's kind of a limit. The devices start to degrade in their performance above dimensions of like something like 50 to 100 microns. It's hard to make uniform, high quality 2D materials with dimensions larger than that. And that turns out to be um, uh, difficult for a couple of reasons. One is naturally, if you're going to make something that's sold at the CVS, you need to be able to make it rapidly. It needs to be repeatable. But if we want these things, even more importantly, if we want these things to function well, the size of the transducer turns out to be pretty important. And by function well, I mean to give us data within a reasonable amount of time. So this is a paper published a, a long time ago, again, back in the early days when folks were thinking about using these, these low dimensional materials with exquisite sensitivity for virus and, and other uh, biomedical or biomolecular detection applications. And so, so this paper by, by Sheehan has some really interesting data. I think that people were thinking, hey, we can make these devices super small and that's going to be great. You can pack a high density of devices if you want to do multiplex. I and mean, there's all kinds of great things you can do if you make these devices really small. But this paper shows that small isn't necessarily good. <laughs> so if you put a drop of a sample on the surface of one of these electronic sensors, this uh, graph shows you how big your transducer is compared to how long it will take to get a biomolecule to diffuse through this drop and to the surface so that you can detect it. So there's some assumptions about how many molecules have to get to the surface before you can detect them. There's some geometric sizes. There's a concentration of the protein you're trying to detect in this uh, drop. But these are all kind of, of assumptions that are in line with what we want to do. And what we see is that the ideal range where you get detection of low concentrations of biomolecules in reasonable amounts of time on the order of minutes, you've got to be in this 100 micron or greater size range. And so that really makes traditional 2D materials fabrication processes Mm, a little bit problematic for making effective devices uh, for, for measuring the kinds of uh, concentrations that we're interested in. So we need a different way to make these. If we want to make them quickly, if we want them to be repeatable, we want to make them at like reasonable temperatures without a lot of energy input to reduce cost. And if we want to make them the right size so that we get uh, readings in a, a desirable amount of time. And so what we're doing is we're using a roll-to-roll -roll process to make these devices. And there's some, some features of this process that I think are pretty unique that really enable very high throughput processing uh, such that we can make a, a million of these chips uh, within a, a single eight-hour shift. And each chip has nine channels on it. So I've never talked to another group where they can make so many two-dimensional devices in such a short amount of time with such a high yield and at such a low cost. And so this is a, a picture of this uh, roll-to-roll -roll system that we use. This is kind of a, a development scale system. It can, can accommodate a roll that's 500 millimeters wide and a roll, we're using a roll of glass. So um, Flexible glass is about 100 microns thick, and we buy it in these 20 meter long rolls. And we can feed the roll through this system and perform these different uh, vapor phase operations on the roll. And we can use a laser in between. So we use the laser to pattern the electrical contact. So we sputter metal all over the glass. Then we use a laser, and this is a, a fantastic laser. It, it scans the surface at very high speeds, up to 12,000 millimeters per second. And then we can apply the semiconducting material, and we can pattern that material with the laser as well. So this, uh, this particular process, here's a, a picture of one of these sheets. So you can see the patterns of the metal are these black lines. If you squint, we'll look at this a little more closely. If you squint, you can see a series of gaps in these lines. And each of the gaps, if you zoom in on it, looks like this. And uh, so you've got the, the metal and then there's a gap. That gap is filled with this MOS2 that's sputtered on the surface. This is all conducted at room temperature, so the MOS2 is amorphous. It's stoichiometric, 
but it's amorphous. And so we have to do something to it to make it be crystalline so that it has the semiconducting properties that we're looking for. In this process, the slowest step is the metal deposition process. And uh, we can roll that thing at a rate of about uh, just over a meter per minute. Uh, and if you and, and that's the slowest part of the process. And so that results in um, a million of these chips, a chip being one of these little guys, uh, a million of those in about 80 minutes. So what I just showed you was this part of the process where we do this like deposition, patterning, deposition, and patterning. Then we've got to put some energy into that MOS2 so we can run it through like a... Um, like a, a heated tube, uh, we can run the sheet through there and then we get crystal and MOS2. So that's the way to make the base device. Then if we want to make it specific for a particular virus, we've got to do something to it. We've got to functionalize the surface so that it selectively binds to the target protein of interest if we're talking about virus detection. I just want to show you um, some of the steps. So, So one of the reasons that we're able to make such a so many devices in such a short amount of time is because instead of a photolithography process, we're using a laser-based process. So if you look in this region I just circled, you'll see the laser is interacting with this metal-coated glass sheet. And so it's writing this series of 10 contacts uh, on the surface. And uh, actually, this is kind of a, an old movie. This is an old style pattern, and the laser conditions are a little bit old. So now we do it at about, um, it takes about a quarter of the time. So this is in real time, and it takes five seconds to pattern one of these chips. Now it takes about a second to, to pattern one of the, the chips that we're using. So this is a really nice way if, if we're if we're interested in 100 micron or tens of micron scale features, the laser is a great alternative to, to photolithography. If we wanted to make smaller devices, we'd be stuck with more traditional patterning techniques. But this is a, a way to do patterning that's really fast and inexpensive. So now we want to functionalize these devices. So here's a, a picture of a device. If we if we apply um, some sort of specific binding agent, right? Something to put on the MOS2 that makes it bind only to the target protein. If we do it by hand, um, with the smallest hand pipette, or the pipette that pipettes the smallest volume that I know of, we still get drops that are much bigger than our surface. And this is problematic. We don't want to have all this excess antibody on the side that uh, is just going to inhibit the signal, right? If I have, if I put a sample on here and I have a virus particle and it binds to this antibody out here, it's not going to give me any change in my conductivity or any change in my current flow. I need the binding to occur here. So we stopped doing this by hand and we started using uh, different techniques to apply the antibodies in a, a more precise manner. So this is a, a picoliter spotter. It's got a teeny tiny pipette tip and it just pipetted these, you know, tens of picoliter volumes of antibody solution onto those gaps. So you can program this thing, you can have multiple heads, and it operates on a roll flowing through the, the system. So this is a way to get kind of higher sensitivity, but it's also adds a, a nice degree of automation to the, the process. Uh, finally, we make these devices in a sheet and you've got to cut them out and we use a, a laser singulator to cut these devices out. So you can see this is an industrial laser singulator. You can see some, some wave guiding of the laser through this flexible glass. Then it's cutting out uh, devices, a single device, a bunch of single devices from the sheet. And then they can be um, kind of picked and placed by a robot into uh, some packaging that's uh, usable with this, this reader, right? So here's a chip. This chip is flexible glass. The, the flexible glass, there's nothing useful about having the device be flexible. The only thing flexibility gives us is access to this roll-to-roll -roll process for really high throughput. But uh, the glass is inserted in here. This is just a, a prototype that we use in the lab. Uh, the glass is something that the user would never see or touch, right? <laughs> Just because uh, it's it's glass, even though it's flexible glass, it's still relatively easy to break. Um, 
So here, these devices, there's nothing selective about this MOS2. Lots of different molecules will bind. If I put a sample, if I put a nasal swab sample on this MOS2, there's lots of other proteins that are going to have a high affinity for the MOS2. And it's going to be hard to deconvolute what's the signal from the virus and what's the signal from the other ambient proteins. So having some way to um, functionalize the MOS2 surface is really important. And it turns out that, that MOS2, I, I kind of talked about how I think MOS2 is superior to graphene for this application because of sensitivity. But there's another aspect of MOS2 uh, in terms of its composition that I feel like makes it a really superior material for binding. And that's that I can take an antibody. And antibodies are great for, for inducing this specific response because Every antibody is unique in this little zone up here and this little zone here. So at the tops of the arms of this Y, there's a binding region. And that region is made up of these all these amino acids that are folded up in this unique way, such that binding only to a specific protein will occur. Right. And so, so this is how antibodies work in our body. There are antibodies that will be um, kind of generated to interact with a particular virus particle or protein. Well, that is uh, something specific to every antibody, but all antibodies have the same general architecture shaped like this Y. And if you break the antibody here or here, there's some really sulfur-rich amino acids for every antibody that's the common antibody in your blood. There's a sulfur-rich region here. And so what we decided to explore was what if we make some sulfur vacancies on the surface, and we can control that. We can tailor how many sulfur vacancies there are. Can we control the binding density of these antibody fragments, right? We wanted to use whole antibodies originally, but then we realized that there's nothing keeping the region that we want to be exposed to the sample from binding to the MOS2, and then that would do us no good. If the binding region's bound down here, then we're not going to get the, the selective binding that we want. But if we cut the antibody, then we get it to bind such that the, the region that's specific to looking for the proteins of interest in the sample is exposed to the sample. Not only that, when we're doing this kind of charge-based detection, the closer we can get the charged molecule to the surface, the stronger the response is going to be, right? There's this inverse relationship between the, the strength of interaction between uh, opposite charges. It's inversely proportional to the distance. So the closer we can get the protein to the surface, the better. By breaking this antibody up into smaller pieces, then we do just that. So this is a step that gets us great, uh, greater selectivity and sensitivity. And we don't have to do any intermediate functionalization for lots of uh, these kinds of tests where you want to bind an antibody to the surface, or lots of these applications. You have to do some functionalization of both the antibody and the transducer surface. And in this case, everything is just kind of built in pretty naturally. So I've shown you how we make the devices and given you some kind of cartoons about how they work. We wanted to do some kind of validation, like do they work the, the way that we think that they will? And uh, one easy way to do that, or one accepted way to do that is using a quartz crystal microbalance. So this is our quartz crystal microbalance device. And if, you, if you're not familiar with this technique, what we do is we have a little piezoelectric crystal that's made out of quartz, and we coat it with MOS2. And then we stick it in this QCM system and it, it's, it's vibrating that uh, piezoelectric quartz surface and, and monitoring the frequency of those vibrations, right? There's some resonant frequencies and we can see what those are. And so we flow a solution over the surface. And if we have something in the solution that binds to the surface, it's gonna affect the frequency at which this thing resonates as piezoelectric material. And so we can use this as a really precise uh, balance. And so we can measure attachment rates of different molecules as they flow over the surface. And so we did just that. And so what I wanna show you is, are some results from two experiments. And the experiments are identical 
up until this line that I'm drawing on the screen. So what we did is we took a, a 2D MOS2 coded QCM chip, and that's kind of a unique experiment. These QCM chips, they're like uh, just over a centimeter in diameter, making a continuous uniform MOS2 film on a QCM chip is something that's maybe a little bit challenging or was pretty challenging to do um, up until recently. So that's kind of nice. There's not a lot of QCM data for this type of MOS2 film. And then we flow an antibody solution. So the concentration of the antibodies in this buffer that we're flowing over the surface is 50 nanograms per milliliter. And so on the y-axis, you've got accumulated mass, and on the x-axis, you've got time. And so you can see we've got this kind of uh, isotherm where we have binding until saturation of these antibodies. And maybe there's a transition. The line gets a little fuzzier, and the slope changes a little bit at this point. I think that's probably where we form a monolayer of antibodies, and then we have binding of kind of antibody on antibody, antibody after that, where we have a slope change and kind of a more noisy signal. And that is maybe that assertion is maybe further backed up by this uh, data where we stopped flowing a solution with proteins in it and just flew the buffer solution through the QCM. And you see we have this reduction in mass. It's about equivalent for both. And it kind of ends up back at this mass where the slope change occurred. So we think we get you know about 80 nanograms per square centimeter of this antibody on the surface. And then the experiment's different to the right of this line. So these are flu antibody fragments that are bound to the surface. And here we took the wrong antigen, the non-complementary antigen. This is a SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. And you can see there's no binding of that protein to this antibody functionalized MOS2 surface. But here, when we flow the complementary protein in, you can see this massive and immediate increase in mass accumulation. This was exciting for us because antibodies, they're meant to be flowing around in the fluid of our bodies, right? And their binding occurs, they're, they're free to, to accommodate any kind of strain associated with the binding event. When they're bound to a surface like these antibodies are, we weren't sure if they would still work, um, especially for these smaller antibody fragments where there's a little less room to accommodate any sort of strain or any sorts of differences associated with attachment of a, a protein. So this was a really exciting result for us and, and kind of uh, gave us some motivation to, to move forward. Uh, so we've done a lot of these different kinds of QCM analyses where we, we look at binding um, to these services for, for different kinds of, of antibodies. Um, I'm going to skip that. I just want to show you some of the... Oops, not that fast. I just want to show you some of the capabilities of these sensor devices. Um, Nice. Okay, sorry about that. I got distracted. So I talked about one of the primary advantages of 2D material electronic-based sensing as being an increase in sensitivity. I just want to show you the kind of, of sensitivity that we observe in these, uh, in these devices. So here you can see I've got a bunch of curves for application of solutions with different concentrations of the target protein from one femtogram all the way up to 10 picograms. And, and I've got a, a negative control as well. And what you can see is that we're able to detect these concentrations all the way up to the green line is at 10 femtograms per milliliter. This dark blue line and the negative control overlap with each other. And we did kind of a, a short calculation, a back of the envelope calculation to see how many proteins are in these different samples, right? We knew the volume of the sample and we knew the concentration, um, the mass per volume. And in this 10 femtogram sample that we're able to detect, there's 250 target proteins in that whole sample. And there's, you know, about uh, 25 proteins in this one femtogram per milliliter sample. So it's not a surprise that, that we can't really detect beyond that kind of range in these devices. And you can see the time, right? The time for detection, we have separation, strong separation uh, from the negative control within a few minutes for this. Like, this is one of the, the first sets of devices that we made. And we were excited to see how sensitive the, the detection is for these devices. 
So we um, started scaling these devices up and this enables us to make lots of measurements. And so that's something that's sometimes challenging to find in the literature is data from, from lots of, of individual measurements because it's hard to make uniform 2D devices. And so this is a uh, detection for a particular protein and you can see differentiation between the negative control, which has a tendency to dip negative in this case. And these, um, these were nice because the response was proportional to the concentration, right? So we can see uh, these different concentrations, maybe suggesting a quantitative test. Right now, when you take a, a virus test at home, it's binary, it's on or off. Do you have it or don't you? Here, you can start to get some understanding of how much of the, the virus is, is in your body. So, so we did these kinds of demonstrations. We worked with an industrial partner and they said, oh, it's great you can detect this protein. We wanna know if you can detect another protein. And I'm kind of proud of this, that within that they sent us these proteins, the, the antibody fragments and the complementary antigen. And within four days, we're able to make a test that has the same kinds of, of limits of detection as the, the other materials that we're using. So this idea of using the MOS2 chemistry and the antibody chemistry to make these, um, these devices, to make these selective layers, is one that appears to be kind of universally applicable to any kind of antibody fragment that's, that's cut in the same way. Uh, this has a lot of implications, right? Um, getting to a, a test, having a test, is what enables us to understand how a disease is transmitted and how it's um, how it's cured, right? So, if there's another pandemic, using this technology it should be straightforward within a short amount of time to get to the kinds of detection limits that would be useful for for inhibiting the impact or reducing the impact of a, a pandemic. So I want to I want to end there, and uh, I hope that I've shown you a new way of thinking about two D materials and, and devices with integrated two D materials. It's uh, it's a little bit different than what is usually done, and and we do some work in the the area of traditional two D materials, and um, it's it's nice. It's nice to be able to get so much data for so many devices in such a short amount of time. The, the sensitivity and the, the fact that these devices are fabricated using kind of typical microfabrication, electronic fabrication techniques gives us a, a level of repeatability that's not really achievable in a lateral flow assay. And so getting to something quantitative seems a lot more likely using this new approach for detection, this electronic based approach rather than a visual or optical based approach. And um, uh, finally, we see that that the 2G materials do what they're supposed to. Uh, high sensitivity is kind of a, a promised benefit of using these materials, and, and they deliver with routine measurements in the 10 to 100 femtogram per milliliter region consistent with, with PCR. So, so that's the end of my presentation. I would be really happy to have a, a discussion with, uh, with you or talk about any questions that you might have. Chris, it does look like there's a one question in the Q&A at this time. If you'd like to proceed, read them out loud and answer questions as they come in. Yeah. Okay, okay anybody... so the, the question that I see here is, how does the quality in terms of defects of MOS2 influ influence the reproducibility of the result? And I guess my answer to that question is, as long as the defect density is uniform for all of the devices, right, or for all the MOS2 transducers and all the devices, then the reproducibility is going to be very repeatable. And if we're careful, I, I guess one, one facet to consider is these materials are are really good, not just at detecting viruses, but detecting like um, like humidity and the concentration of different kinds of molecules in the air. So we have to be careful how we handle the devices between the time they're fabricated and the time they're functionalized. But once the devices are functionalized, once we've terminated the reactive sites with these antibody fragments or other kinds of proteins, then they're much less reactive. And so, you know, if you make a highly defective MOS2 film and let it sit in the air, 
is going to change at a, its properties will change at a different rate than a, a defect free MLS2 sample. So I think I understand kind of the, the motivation behind the question, but as long as we're careful with the way we handle the devices, we can introduce whatever level of defects we want, but we can still maintain the, the same kinds of responses. And you can see in the data that I was showing, you know, with multiple responses from, from different devices, they're pretty consistent. All right. If anybody has any additional questions, we'll give everybody a few minutes to type them in. Um, and hopefully everybody's hung in there for today's e-talk. We're going to have an evaluation form that should show up in a separate screen, but let's give everybody a minute to type in additional questions. I can go ahead and share some informational slides and closing slides, and that'll give some people some time to type them in for you, Chris. Okay. Great. Thank you. All right. So I do want to thank you, Chris, for presenting mass production of 2D electronic medical diagnostics for home use. This is a very interesting topic, and we appreciate you presenting and preparing the material for everybody. Um, again, I do want to remind people that we have some upcoming additional training programs in place. AVS National will have a short course program in November. It's going to contain the four-day fundamentals of vacuum technology. This has been a high interest course throughout the year, and uh, we will be offering it in person November 6th through 9th. Registration will be coming later this month. Also, our AVS Rocky Mountain chapter will be hosting an in-person short course program in Westminster, Colorado, September 13th through 15th. They are still currently developing their schedule and registration will hopefully be open later this month as well. So check out the AVS short course schedule page uh, later in June or early July. On June 22nd, we have an AVS professional development webinar, uh, Cultivate Your Leadership Skills, a review, a review of Effective Leadership Traits and Practices with Lily Wang. Uh, this is a free one hour webinar from 2 to 3 p.m. Eastern time. This will also follow the Zoom platform. Registration is open for this event. And we mentioned at the beginning, we have some upcoming technical conferences. We just finished an ICMCTF meeting, which Chris is heavily involved with as well. So this was a nice way to present some material here at this eTalk. Uh, we have ALD, ALE coming up July 23rd through 26th in Bellevue, Washington. MIOMD, August 6th through 10th in Norman, Oklahoma. We have Gallium Oxide Workshop, August 13th through 16th in Buffalo, New York. NAMBI 2023, September 17th through 20th in Madison, Wisconsin. And our AVS 69th International Symposium and Exhibition, November 5th through 10th in Portland, Oregon. That's where we'll be hosting the Fundamentals of Vacuum Technology short course. You can find all this on the AVS events calendar on our website. And we'd uh, like to thank those of you who are current AVS Platinum members and remind you to log into My AVS to access your benefits. And for those who are not current members, we encourage you to join our network. Uh, you can enhance your scientific and professional knowledge, have opportunities to develop and practice your leadership skills, and receive discounts on various subscriptions and meeting attendance. Uh, possibly the ones coming up throughout the year. So check that out. And also check out our website, membership benefits. And if you're a student, we encourage you to also join AVS and find out about student chapters, career services, and more. And with that, we'd like to have you complete the online evaluation form. But I do see another question in the q and I believe, Chris, for you. Yeah, I'll go ahead and read the question. Thanks, Heather. It says, you compared the MOS2 to graphene, but there are other 2D material systems. I wonder if you've ever tried uh, any other materials or have any plans in that way. And that's a, that's a great question. So yeah, we like to work with, with lots of different uh, 2D materials. I have to say that we haven't, for this particular application, we haven't explored other materials. A, primarily because MOS2 is so inexpensive and naturally abundant. B, this is a 2D material, the non-graphene 2D material that I feel like we know the most about. And uh, and C, it, it's working great. Like, we don't have any complaints with uh, with this material. Um, and so a lot of other um, transition metal that are are not as naturally abundant or even naturally occurring at all. 
And so that makes uh, MLS2 really advantageous from, from our perspective. There's some things in terms of recyclability that make MLS2 really attractive as well, or molybdenum-based um, uh, TMDs uh, that, that we're kind of hanging on to this MLS2 idea. But great question, and, and we do have some data on showing kind of antibody interactions with other types of, of TMDs and other 2D materials in general. So we'll probably be sharing some of that stuff in the, in the near future. Um, I see, Heather, there's another question. I'll go ahead and read that if that's all right with you. Keep going. This question is, uh, is this process in research stage or are there plans to partner with a medical device provider if you're able to share? And the answer is yes, is, is right now the, the work is funded by a, a medical uh, device manufacturer. Um, so, so yeah, so so all the work we're doing and uh, we, we closely interact with this partner. It's something that we'd like to, to turn into a product in the, in the near future. So, so it, it evolved. We started in the research phase at the beginning of the pandemic and uh, it's evolved in the last two years. We've been working with a, a specific medical device uh, manufacturer. Chris, there was a question in the chat. If you can switch over to that, I saw one over there from one person. Yeah. What would be your best guess when these sensors will become available commercially? Oh, that's a great question. So it's dependent on FDA approval, and that process is a little bit unpredictable. <laughs> oh, sorry about that. My uh, my dog thinks it's time for the talk to be over. Uh, but uh, so that's a great question. It takes a while for any kind of product, even a medical, even something that doesn't go inside your body. It takes some time. Um, and so it's going to be at least a year is, is what I would say, at least for the devices that we're working with. There are other other teams that are working in a similar way. It's always difficult to evaluate where other teams are in their process. Maybe some of them are a little more um, carefully guarded with their progress than we are. Um, but I don't know of any other group that's that's able to make so many devices with such good repeatability statistics. Um, so for us, it's at least a year, um, and we're we're working hard to do it as fast as we can. Great question. All right. Does anybody have any other questions? You can. We have another minute or so we can do. If you have any questions, you can type them into the Q and A. I'll keep an eye on the chat just in case there's one in there. But. Um... Otherwise, uh, we'll call it a day for everyone. Well, I'm sorry I can't be there in person to talk with you. I, I saw the list of participants, and uh, there's a lot of you I'd like to say hi to and uh, and get to meet, but hopefully we can communicate uh, electronically, or I'll see you at an uh, upcoming ABS meeting or another, another location soon. Yeah, that would be great. If you do have additional questions, uh, Chris's email is available. Uh, he had it on his slides, and uh, if you can email me, at heather at avs.org, I can also assist with that. But at this time, I'm just going to thank you, Chris, for preparing and presenting the material today. And uh, I want to remind people to complete the online evaluation form. You should see it in a separate browser as you log out. Uh, however, if you don't see it, I will send it via email. We'd appreciate your feedback. I know this was a very interesting talk and appreciate everybody's time. So thank you, Chris, and thank you everybody for joining us today. Have a good rest of your day. Thank you, it was my pleasure, Heather, thanks again. Thanks.